Um, so I do apologize for the delay. I did have an emergency. Here's my pencil I was looking for. Um, I did have an emergency and my son had like this giant thing in his throat on Thursday morning. And so it scared me and I took him to the hospital and it took us forever and a day to get through the whole emergency system. Turns out he had strep and luckily, you know, me and my daughters don't have it. I was really surprised because that little booger kisses everybody. So <laughs> I was really shocked that none of us, none of the rest of us had it. But so we've got him, he's on antibiotics. He's good now, nothing's crazy. He was just having some hard time breathing because it was like really covering his whole passageway. Um, but he's good now, so no, nothing to worry about there. We did test him for COVID, he doesn't have it. So we still don't have it in my household or anything like that. If we did, I would not be here. We would have to be remote, okay? Um, but luckily we don't have anything that has to do with COVID, so we're good. Um, but it did take me, it threw me off because then I didn't get home until later that evening. And I promised you guys I was going to record that lecture, right? Because it was my fault that we missed out that day, right? Um, and I don't want to miss out too many days because I do want to have some time to go over that final review with you before you have to take the final, okay? So I wanted to record it, but I ended up recording really, really late at night. So I apologize if I sounded super tired while I was recording it. I was just out of it. It was literally like 10 or 11 and I had been up since three o'clock in the morning. So I tried to, you know, just muster out what I could just to get the content out of there. And I had two lectures to record. So I was like super, super tired that day. So I did not end up grading that night, okay, or that day. On Friday, I did end up getting all the grading done for both this class and the online class. And then Saturday, I went in and I tried to get all the data and put everything in there and make my spreadsheets. I wrote down all these reports. Um, and then I just was tired after that. <laughs> and yesterday, I was like, I've been working six days this week. It's been nonstop. So I took the day off yesterday and took the kids to Fiesta, Texas and whatnot. So I had to have one day off, right? <laughs> So I didn't get these uploaded. So if you're in the online class, um, well, you guys are not, but the online students have not received these reports yet. They will today. As soon as I get back into the office after this class, I'm gonna post these reports for the online students. And I think there's a couple of people that are in this face-to-face -face class, but choose to stay online. So they'll get their reports as well, okay? But you guys, I've given you back your papers already. So you'll see this report in the front and then behind it, you should see your graded tests, right? Um, I am going to offer the unit three test corrections, so I'm going to put it as an assignment inside the web assign and the unit three um, test corrections will be due. I think it's the 15th, but I'm going to make sure, but it would be next Monday. Okay. Uh, yes, it is the 15th. So on the Monday, 11, 15, 21. Okay, it'll be due at 11.59 p.m. And so just like the one, the time we've done the corrections before, you're only gonna correct the problems that you did not earn all 10 points for, right? Each problem was worth 10 points. So if you got all 10, you do not need to correct that problem. If you got nine points and you really want that extra half, right? Then you have to redo the whole problem and just correct what is probably a notation thing but just correct whatever that one thing was. If you got zero points, then do, please do the whole problem because that's an extra five points you can add. If you have two problems that you got zero points for, just doing those two can lift your grade up a whole letter grade, right? So um, definitely, definitely take advantage of the test corrections. This is a college algebra test. So this one will stick. It's not like the three, four test where those could be, that whole grade could be replaced, right? This one is one of the main ones. So you definitely wanna have all of your 14-14 tests, all of the unit, unit one, unit two, unit three, unit four, unit five, all five of those, you wanna have them as best as you can so that you can get the highest grade for college algebra. And then if you didn't do so hot on the 314, it can, you'll have a better grade in that class as well, okay? So this test definitely, please, um, in all of their advices, you didn't get like a super awesome grade on this test, I told you to, do the test corrections, okay? So you can improve that score just a little bit. The more you improve this score, the more points that you add to your bank, okay? So whatever your total points are, that's literally like the grade that you have right now, besides all the other things that we haven't gotten yet, right? We haven't done unit four and we haven't done unit five yet. So that's, or the final. 
that is still another, what, 45 points up for grabs. So if you want to pass, you really need to have at least 30 points in the bank right now, okay? If you don't want to have to get hundreds on everything, you want more than 30 points right now, okay? If you don't have 30 points right now, this is those are the ones that I'm worried about, and I really need you to go back, not only to do the test corrections, but to also go back to all the old homework assignments and just make sure that they're all 80% or higher, okay? If I gave you some specific advice, like you needed to have 90% or higher, it's probably because you already had an 80, but you still need a little bit more points, and I might have suggested to go back and make them go up to a 90, okay? Um, but you should have your test average, whatever that is. I calculated it at the 15% points, and then I got this. So let's say I had a 74 homework average, then I just did this. And so then that gave me 11.1 .1 points. Let's say I made 64 on test one. Then I have 9.6 points. Let's say I made an 83 on the next one. And then let's say I made, you know, I'm improving here and I made a 90 on the last one. And then all I did was just add up all of those numbers. So 12.45 plus 9.6 plus 11.1. .1. And I have this many points. So this person, this hypothetical person I just created, right, has this many points. This is good, right? As long as this is over 30, it's totally possible for you to pass the class. If it's not over 30, it's still possible. You just have a lot of work to do, right? Then I took that number, whatever that number was, and I put it over the total points you could have possibly gotten. So if all of these were hundreds, you would have had 15 points here, 15 points there and so forth, right? So that's 60 points total that you could have. So I just took your number and divided it by 60 and I got, um, I got this, but if I move it over twice, that's a 78 pretty much percent. And so then this person is at a C right now, okay? And so that's where this letter grade is coming from. Now, I'm not going to enter this letter grade anywhere. Midterms is already over, right? That part of the semester. This is just to kind of let you know where you're at right now, okay? That doesn't mean that that's where you'll be at at the end of the semester, because anything can happen. You can either fall off and not do well and not do any more homework for the last two units, right? Or you can do your test corrections and do your uh, all your old homework, and then now you're in a better position than you were before, okay? So anything can happen at this point. We're still not at the point of no return yet, okay? I would say maybe I'm hoping to do the unit four test before we have that drop date, okay? So that way, once you get your unit four test, I can try to you know go through it and grade it real fast, come up with these reports, and then at that point, you'll know like what I'm going to need on the unit five and the final. And then if you see like, oh, I'm going to need a 100 on the unit five and the final, and you're like, there's no way I'm going to get 100. And you choose to drop, that's on you, okay? Or if I tell you, oh, you only need to have a 60 on the, the, the unit five and the final to pass. And you're like, oh, I could do that. And so then you choose not, you choose to stay in the class, right? So I'll have those numbers for you. Um, in the next test okay but right now this is just kind of a guide to let you know where you're at right now okay and it can go up like this person right here notice that they're there right they need how many more points let's see if i wanted a b i would have to have 48 points total but i have 46.65 so i need this many more points i'm going to divide that by 0.15 that means i need to raise my homework average at least nine points so I would want my homework average to be an 83, okay? So for me personally, I would go back and all the ones that are not at 80 or higher, I would go back and do all of those. If it's already 100, it's good, okay? You'll probably get those nine points just by going back and improving all the lower than 80s up to 80, okay? So that's, I just wanted to explain that real quick because it is a little bit, it's a lot of information, but, I wanted you to kind of have an idea. Now, we did cover 5.1 and 5.2 in the video. I don't know who's all seen it and who hasn't. Um, I wish there was a way to capture that so I could be like, hey, you probably don't understand what we're talking about today. And then the others like start getting more interaction with the people who had seen it. Um, 
But we did talk about exponential functions. And so in the past, we've always done polynomials where the base was the variable, right? And then your exponent was some kind of number. And now what they've done is they've swapped those positions on us, right? So now we have the base is a number and your variable is actually in the exponent, right? So it's just a different kind of problem now. These are called exponentials. Now, one thing is, is that that base does have to be greater than zero and it cannot be one because we already know that one raised to any power is still gonna be one, no matter what that power is, right? And so really the function doesn't equal an exponential, the function just equals a number. And in that case, that's just the horizontal line at one. That is not an exponential function, okay? Exponential functions are supposed to look like this normally. If you have a negative exponent or a function base, it looks like this, okay? So we do talk about that throughout the lecture. Um, it does tell us how to evaluate numbers. Like you're literally just plugging in numbers for X and then evaluating it. So like if they say X equals three and they tell me my base is four, you're literally just typing that in your calculator. If they give you one half, you're doing four to power one half. Nice thing about our calculators is it will do all this for me. I just didn't have a calculator when I was doing this, okay? And so I had to go back and use all my rules to figure it out, right? But you can type four raised to the one half in your calculator and it will just tell you that it's two. Okay, so you don't have to do this stuff, but I did it just to show you, okay? Um, and the exponent can truly be anything, right? It could even be a square root of two. Um, it could be any number that exponent. You just use your calculator to go ahead and evaluate those. So they're just showing you, like you can evaluate it with different numbers. And so I went through all of that. The calculator strokes are different. Notice they're using a graphing calculator to do these keystrokes and we do not use graphing calculators. You guys are engineers and I don't want you getting too dependent on the calculator. I need you to focus on the, the knowledge here. That way you can take that with you to calculus, right? What happens is people get used to the calculator and then they don't remember <laughs> what's going on behind the calculator, okay? So these are actually the keystrokes that you would use. So for instance, this problem there, 0 0.6 raised to the three halves, you would do it in this manner. this button here that lets me type in an exponent then i would type the fraction button and then three go down two go over to the side and then i can hit enter and it gives me that decimal which i never wrote down in here but and then usually it'll tell you to round to a certain decimal place okay now the key thing about these problems when you're graphing is you have to remember and I will have this as like a little information box on the test, okay? But when you're trying to graph an exponential like this, you have to remember that you're gonna have these three key points. The base is the air, okay? So you will always have negative one and the reciprocal of the base as one point. You will always have zero one as another point. And then you will always have one and that base, whatever it was as the third point, okay? So every graph will have all three of those points for an exponential. So I just gave like some examples of the base were two or if the base were four, right? And so then the reciprocal of two is one half, the reciprocal of four is one fourth, the base itself is two and the base itself is four. And so there's my three points. That's all you need to graph an exponential is those three points, okay? Eventually, because now we know about inverses, right? Eventually, we talk about um, the inverses, which is a logarithm. And in the logarithm, the cool thing about inverses that we learned is that all they're doing is swapping those coordinates, aren't they? Right? When you take an inverse, you just swap the coordinates over. So if this is the format for an exponential, where'd it go? If this is the format for an exponential, then for a logarithm, you're just switching them. So the, the reciprocal goes in the X spot and the negative one goes in the Y spot, okay? And the same thing, the one goes for X and the zero goes for Y. A goes for the X and one goes for the Y, okay? We'll get there because it's not, we're not there yet. <laughs> I'm speaking this, why? Because I already have a whole full lecture through it, right? I just want to jog y'all, use memory before I continue, okay? 
this is a very, very important rule because you're going to eventually be asked to solve like gobs and gobs of equations, okay? And this is one of those special rules that you're gonna need to solve equations. So if you see exponentials, okay? So if you see an exponential thing, expression on this side and an exponential expression on that side, your goal is to make them have the same base if you can, okay? Here they already have the same base, right? Once they have the same base, you have this rule that says, well, if this expression is equivalent to that expression and the bases are already the same, the only way those two expressions can be the same is if the exponents are also the same, right? And so then really, I already have the bases are both two. I just need to make sure that that exponent, x plus five, is equal to this exponent, which is negative four x, right? And then from there, regular equation that you can solve doing your regular steps, right? Now, this is also a new thing, this base e. This is called the natural base, and I tried to explain it to you guys referring to pi, right? Pi is one of those common numbers that pop up in um, nature. And amazing how many people don't know why or how. Does anybody know why pi popped up, where it came from, why it exists? Nobody? Okay. Well, the Greeks took circles, all different varying sizes. And they, what they did was they measured their circumference, all of them. They measured their circumference. And then they measured the radiuses, actually the diameters the whole diameter. And what they found was that when you take the circumference divided by the diameter, it didn't matter how big or how little that circle was, that ratio was always 3.14, blah, blah, blah. The exact same number, always. Isn't that weird, right? <laughs> so that's where that number came from, okay, was from circles. If you took that ratio of the circumference divided by the diameter, you always got this number. It was so weird. So then they started using this number a lot, okay? And eventually we, they just used a symbol for it because it represents an ongoing decimal. You don't wanna write all that, right? Every single time. So they just picked the letter. It's Greek letters, so it's <laughs> But we also have one called the natural number that also comes up a lot. Now, I couldn't even begin to explain to you all the different places that it pops up. It pops up a lot, and it has to do with like calculus and above, okay? So it's really hard for me to try to explain it to you. It's not like geometric like this one, okay? Um, but once you get to, if you get higher than calculus, you might learn where that is and what it, how it comes about. But I think you do address it um, at Cal 1. They show you one, one way to find that special number. Okay, and then eventually you'll learn more if depending on how high up in math you go. But it is a cool number. It's this number here. It's always this number, just like pi is always 3.14, right? And you do have that button in your calculator. It's kind of hidden. Do you see it right there? That third button down, it has E with a little box, right? If I press it, um, just E, and I'd only want E all by itself, just put a one exponent. Okay, and if I hit enter, I should get this number. Okay, so just one e is this. Now, if I square it or cube it, it's going to be a different number, right? Um, but it is in your calculator, so you can use it. Even if I wanted to type one over e, remember that one over e is the same as e to the negative exponent, right? So if I wanted to do that, I would do e to the negative one, and I would get this decimal here. Okay, so you can type in the fraction, you just have to use the exponent form of it, okay? Okay, so just remember it is a constant, don't forget, it's not a variable, so don't start trying to treat it like a variable and solving for it and all that weird stuff, because it's not a variable, it's just a number. And then of course we used our calculator to plug in all those different numbers, try them so you can make sure you're getting the right values okay so try to use your calculator to get those again this is the graphing calculator stroke so it's not exactly the same although it's not too much different ours just has this button instead of the x button right but it's literally the same thing you type on clear you type that button and then you just type in whatever the exponent is and then hit enter right it's not too much different from this description here now 
why do we need exponentials? There are two big things that have to do with exponentials. One of them is growth and decay, which is really important in science because if you want to know um, like how fast bacteria is growing or how fast a virus is spreading, right? Or things like that, those things behave in exponential behavior. And so it's super important to help with that. Also, you know, the forensic scientists can like age how long a body's been dead, right? That's because of the decaying part of it, okay? And so these things, these equations do help you with both uh, growth and decay. And both of them are super helpful in science. Um, another thing is money, right? That's the more important one <laughs> for everybody, right? Is the money. And I just wanted to share with you an experience that I had because I think it's super important because a lot of people are like, when and where is this stuff used in real life? It is actually used, and I had somebody ask me on a test, why do we have to do this or something? I don't remember how they phrased it exactly. But it was the problem where you had like three, or you had two zeros, you had five and like four plus I or something on the test, right? And so you had to remember that you also had four my I, and then you had to multiply everybody out, right? That whole problem. Um, and somebody's like, eyes, when am I, we're never gonna see this in daily life. And I was like, you might not be solving equations like this in daily life, but electrical engineers do. And what do electioneer, what are electrical engineers responsible for? They're responsible for our electricity and they're responsible for your computers. So if you are using a computer or electricity, which I know you are if you're watching my video, right? <laughs> you are using, quote unquote, using imaginary numbers, okay? So yes, you might not be doing it in daily life. You are using it in your daily life for sure, okay? This is super important for me because I actually saved six grand knowing this information that, I'm gonna, that we're gonna talk about right here, okay? I don't know how many of you have bought a car. I bought my first car when I was like 23, okay? And when I went to go buy my car and I bought a little Kia, I didn't have lots of money. I was just a tutor <laughs> Paul all through college. Um, so I was trying to buy like something super cost effective, right? So I went to go buy me a little Kia and the guy comes back with, oh, this is how much you're going to have to pay. And this is the total after, you know, however many years of my contract, right? And I was like, wait a minute, because I know how interest works, okay? And I know that you do have this formula here for when you compound, like you can compound annually, what is compounding? That's like how often you collect the interest, okay? So I could collect the interest once a year, I collect it twice a year, I collect it each quarter, I could collect it each month, I could collect it each week or even daily. And then eventually we talked about that one special guy where they collect it continuously, right? And so when I did the calculations, this is the worst one. This is the one that will give, you will have to pay the most interest, right? If you're trying to get a loan, to buy a car, this is the one that will make you pay the most interest. And I use this, I put the car's value in there, I put the interest rate that they told me I was gonna have to pay, and I put the years for the amount of contract that they told me I was gonna have to pay. I put all that in there, and with the interest and in all of this calculation, I showed them, I was like, this is the dollar amount that I get, but your dollar amount is like six grand more than what I've done. How are calculating interest because what formula are you using? Because I know you're not using a basic formula because if you were using a basic formula, then you should be using this formula or this formula and neither one of those is giving me that outrageous number. And they were like, oh, 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 let me go look, let me go look. And they go and they compute, compute, compute. And then they come back and they're like, oh, you're right. It's not supposed to be that, it's supposed to be this. And then they gave me the next paper that had the amount that I was gonna owe. Same rate, same time everything the same, but it was six grand less than the original thing that they tried to give me. Imagine how many people out there buying cars that do not know this information and are getting gypped, right? That's a lot of people. So I thought it was super important to stress that story because it did save me money and you might wanna actually pay attention to this stuff because it might help you if you go to try to buy a car, right? So everyone in my family takes me with them when they go to buy a car now. <laughs> Come with me, you need to go do the numbers. <laughs> I'm like, okay, fine. Um, but yes, it's super, super important. So if you learn anything in this class, please learn this so you can save yourself, right, from having to overpay on a vehicle. Okay, back to the thing. So there's two formulas. One of them is when it says continuous, 
And the other one is if it doesn't say continuous, okay? If it says compounded annually, compounded weekly, all of those words, then you're gonna use this one, okay? Um, I was so tired though when I was recording this that I didn't even remember my story. Like I didn't even think to tell it because I was just exhausted. <laughs> Now, a lot of these pages I skip over just because they're kind of showing you where the E came from, but I'm really not interested in that. I'm more concerned on how we're going to use it, right? Um, I can, I took for granted that pi was pi this whole time, right? Y'all never asked how, why is there a pi, right? I just explained it to you, but you've been working all this time without knowing. <laughs> so we're going to do the same thing with E. You'll learn more about E when you get to calculus. So we got to this problem and I think, did we do this problem? I think we did, but I went ahead and looked at their solutions. So they wanted to do it quarterly, monthly and continuously, but we were gonna use the same information for all three, okay? So the amount that I invest or the amount that I borrow is always going to be your P, okay? And I think I wrote that down here. Your P is always your investment or your loan amount. So this was my P. My rate how, always has to be in a decimal. And I think I stressed that in the video, but I wanna stress it again, okay? Always has to be in a decimal. Don't plug in three because three is wrong. Three is the percentage and you have to use the decimal, okay? And then of course the T is the five because all the, always the years are gonna be your time. And then they're asking me for my balance, which is that A. So we found the formula here and we literally just plugged in the P for the 12,000. We plugged in the 0 0.03 for the rate. We plugged in four for N twice, right? N pops up twice in this formula. And then five for T. Now why four? Because for the first part, it's saying quarterly, right? So that's why we used N equal four. And then you can type that whole thing in your calculator. I'll show you that. I'm going to type 12,000 parentheses one plus fraction 0 0.03, come to the bottom, four, go to the side, close it. Oops, that's not the right button. And then raise it to the four parentheses five. Mine looks exactly like it does on the paper. Okay. And you just hit enter and it gives you this. Wait. I did, didn't I? Thank you very much. Let me do insert and zero. Good catch, thank you. So yeah, and then this nine will convert that over to a one, right? So it should be always money. So always round to the cent, okay? Always the second decimal place so you can get those cents. If it tells you to round to the nearest dollar, that's the only time you'll ever round to something else other than the cents, okay? So pay attention to those directions. Now number, letter B, was for monthly, so we had to plug in. 12. So all you can literally keep that same thing in your calculator and just change the fours to a 12. I have to insert the two because it's another digit. Down here, I think I'm okay. And then you get that number, right? The one is not enough to convert that over to a zero or to a one. And then the last one had this word. As soon as you see that word, you have to use a totally different formula, okay? And so you don't plug in anything for N. There's no N, it's just always being compounded, right? How in the world are you gonna use a number for that, right? You can't put in infinity. <laughs> okay, so you have to just use this formula and you plug in your rate, your principal and your time. And when you compute it, it gives you that. Just for demonstration, I'll do this one again, make sure I put all my zeros, right? Um, 0 0.03 parentheses five. So it looks exactly the way it does on the paper and you get the exact same number, okay? Okay, now those are sketching the graphs. I just reminded you of the three key points that you're going to have to use. And then here, the one to one function. So notice that this one was an equation, but this side did not have it as a three base and then an exponent, right? And so I had to sit there and figure out, well, how am I going to get that? Now I did it over here um, and then I checked it in my calculator. So what I did was I thought, well, one over 27, I know that 27 is three cubed, right? And then I know that if the three cubed is in the bottom and I wanna write it as a regular number, like a whole number, I have to make my exponent negative, right? And so then I just went in my calculator and just verified that my thinking was correct. And I did get one over 27. So I knew that this was the correct expression to use instead of one over 27, okay? 
Now they have the same base, which means all I have to do is make sure that those exponents are the same, okay? And so then I set the exponents equivalent each to each other and then solve, okay? This is a word problem. I'll let you go through that in the video. 5.2 was eventually talking about logs, okay? So I apologize if I'm repeating everything, but I just want to make sure we're all on the same page before I continue today, okay? Um, this is what they're doing. They're taking the exponential expression, putting in some random variables there, okay? They have some intent in where they place these variables, but nonetheless, that's where they are. If you rearrange them to look like this, okay, this is the logarithmic expression. So you need to understand that these two things are the same statement, okay? They are exactly the same thing. It's just the form in which you write them. This one is called exponential form. This one is called logarithmic form. Okay, it's just a matter of which form you have it in, okay? This is the exponential form of the equation. This is the logarithmic form of the equation. And I'm letting you know, look and pay attention. This is y equals a log, right? But where is y over here? Isn't it up there? So the main thing to remember is that logs are exponents, okay? They're nothing more than exponents. So later today, when I start getting into the properties of logs, you'll notice they look a like the properties of exponents, okay? And that's why, because logs are just weird looking exponents, okay? They're basically asking you, what exponent do you have to raise something to to get something else, okay? That's essentially what it's asking you. So if you see an expression like this, the base, this is called the base, this little super subscript. The subscript here is called the base. We are not gonna have another day like that. Oh my goodness. Wow. So when I write this, I have to swap them. The biggest thing to remember is that the base in the logarithm, when you swap it, becomes the base of the exponential. So that base will always stay the base, okay? And then I like to think of it as whoever was like attached to that base before is now no longer gonna be attached to that base when I rewrite it, okay? So when you're going over here from this form to this form, I think I used this expression to start with and notice that your base is three, right? So then I wrote down the three base, okay? And then instead of having the one over 27 attached to that three base, I'm now gonna have this number attached to the three base. So notice that that's now my exponent, right? The negative three. And then I have no choice but to throw the one over 27 to the other side of the equation because there's only one more spot for a number to go in that other form, right? And so it's just a matter of swapping that form over. And if you go from this one to this one, notice that the base is still a three, right? And instead of attaching this negative three with that three, I'm gonna put the one over 27 with that three. And then the negative three has no choice but to be over there. And it's the exact same thing, isn't it? It's maybe swapped over, right? The equation is swapped, but it's still the same equation, okay? You need to remember that it doesn't matter if your equation looks like this or like that. Both of those are the same, right? Okay, now, Another rule, the reason why this rule is important is because it will help us solve some equations later. And I don't think we got into that. I think for the most part, this was me trying to figure out, right? It says log base two of 32 equals what? And I told you this is an exponent, right? So what I did was I swapped it into this equation. I'm trying to figure out log base two of 32 equals what, right? That's what I wanna know, what does it equal, right? So I just put a question mark there because I don't know what it equals. Then what I did was I used that definition to swap the form over. So I put two as my base, then this guy's gonna be attached to the two and then the 32 is gonna get kicked over to the other side, right? I just swapped the form. And my goal is to figure out what the heck does this base need to be? I mean, this exponent need to be in order to get 32, right? And so all I did was sit there and go on my calculator. I know two to the third, is eight, so try higher, two to the fourth, that's not enough, two to the fifth, and that's exactly 32, right? And so then that's how I figured out that the question mark was actually five, okay? And the same thing here, if I wanted to find this expression, 
I said, well, what the heck is that going to equal? I don't know. So let me switch over the form, right? The base is the three, question mark goes with three, and the one gets kicked over to the other side. And then I'm figuring out, well, three to what power equals one? I know anything raised to the zero power is one, right? And so then I did that. And you can always double check in your calculator. Three raised to the zero power, yes, it's one, okay? And so then that's how I knew that the value was zero because the log is going to be equal to your exponent, right? Okay. And then here, it's the same thing. I just did it. It's just had fractions and negative numbers. That's the only thing that was different. So I want to talk this one out. So we had that expression, log 4, 2. I didn't know what it was equivalent to. I changed over the front. And then I realized, well, I know that the square root of 4 is equal to 2, right? And then how do you write the square root as a fraction exponent? It's 1 half. And you remember this rule? Remember that rule, right? And so if I draw the invisible stuff in, this is an invisible one exponent and this is an invisible two index, right? And so then that's where I got the one, the inside exponent goes on the top, the index goes at the bottom. So my inside exponent over my index, right? And then now I, knew, I know what that exponent is. It's one half, right? Now, what about this expression? Again, I don't know what it's equivalent to, so I put a question mark. You could put a variable instead of a question mark if you don't like question marks, right? Back in the day, I used to use J's all the time just because my name starts with a J. You can use whatever letter you want. It doesn't matter. Uh, once I swap it over, it looks like this. And so I'm like, well, how am I gonna make that look like 10 to some power? And so I know that 100 is 10 squared. And then I know that if I have 10 squared at the bottom and I wanna make it whole, I just make the exponent negative. So you remember all those exponent rules that we learned like way in the beginning, right? They're coming back. So we're gonna have to keep using them, okay? Um, and then that tells me that the exponent is negative two. So that's the answer there. You will have those rules, okay? All these rules. It's not that having everything is a good thing because then you're there sitting there staring at a whole bunch of stuff right <laughs> you don't know exactly what to do okay so but it will be there if you're like i'm not going to memorize all this you're not expected to memorize everything you're expected to know how to use everything okay so there's a little bit of a difference i will give you all the properties i will give you all the definitions you'll have that info there you just need to be able to apply it okay um now, another one is called, we haven't gotten there yet. Oh, yes, we have. Okay, I didn't even mention this in the video. That's awful. <laughs> this sentence right here, it says the logarithmic function with base 10 is called the common logarithmic function. There are only two log buttons in your calculator. There is log like this, and then there's ln. I'll show them to you. They're on the same button. If I press it once, it's LN, and if I press it again, it's LOG. Notice that neither one of those have a subscript, do they? Neither one. So I could not enter something like this into my calculator. I just cannot. I have no choice but to do it this way right now. There's a way, but not yet, okay? Hopefully by the end of today, we'll get there. But I cannot type that in my calculator, okay? However, they want you to know that if you have log base 10 of a number, whatever that number is, you can type in that calculator because that's exactly what the word log all by itself represents. You know how when you take the square root and you don't write the little two, right? So if you write log and you don't write any subscript, it's automatically 10, okay? Why is it 10? Because we count in base 10, do we not? We count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, and it starts all over but with the one in the front. And then it starts all over again with the two in the front for the 20s, right? We count in base 10, which is why that's the common log, okay? So you can do it when there's no base or if the base is 10, because that's the same thing, okay? And in those cases, you can use that button in your calc, okay? The LN one we have not talked about, and I intentionally stopped right there when I was doing the lecture, okay? So we'll continue today talking about that other button, the LN, okay? Um, 
But just FYI, before we get there, these are some of the properties, okay? These are not all of the properties. These are some, a very small little bit of the properties. There's a few, okay? But one of the properties is that or what this base is, if you're taking the log of one, it's going to equal zero. And that's because of this relationship, right? We know that anything raised to the zero power equals one. So they essentially are taking these old exponential rules and just putting them in their log forms. Okay, so this was an old rule that we knew, right? If you have a something by itself, it always has an invisible one exponent, right? We already knew that. And then they just put it in the log form, okay? Same thing with this one. Well, we didn't know this one. This one's completely new. But if your bases and your bases match, you basically just get the exponent there. That's it. And if the bases and the bases match, they kind of cancel each other out and you just get whatever was there and that's it, okay? So remember, exponentials and logarithms are inverses, right? Which is why when you do one and then do the other, they basically undo each other and you only have the x, okay? And it doesn't matter whether you do the log first of the a or you do a of the log. If these bases are the same, these are inverses and they will cancel and you'll just get x, okay? And then this one's um, just like the exponential one. When we had two exponentials with the same exponent or with whatever exponent, as long as they had the same base, we just kind of ignored the bases and just took those exponents equivalent to each other, right? It's the same thing with logs. If your bases are the same, the only way that this expression can equal that expression is if those arguments are the same as well, right? The only way that this can be equivalent, I should use a number, four, can equal something else is if this is also a four, right? That's the only way they could be equivalent is if they are the exact same thing. So that's what they're saying. If this bases are the same, these guys have to be the same, okay? Now, they graph them. And a key thing to remember is that this is how I remember it. I remember these rules for the exponential. I literally only remember one set of rules and then I just swap them, okay? This is how you graph this. But this is the inverse of that, okay? It's the inverse. So what do I do? I just swap the Xs and the Ys. That's literally what we did when we learned about inverses. And so now I have the whole set of points for the logs, okay? So wrote down what the points would look like if for the exponential, and then notice for the logarithm, all they are is just swap, aren't they? Okay. And so I just drew them on the same one. This is two to the power X. And then this one is log base two to the power X. And if you notice, of course, I'm not using graph paper, right? So it's not perfect. <laughs> but if I had drawn that line Y equals X, they should look like mirror images of each other, which was the definition of inverses, right? Okay. So let's go ahead. They go through all this drama. Like, look at how many pages they use to explain that. They use all of that and all of this. And I literally just did it in three points, right? That's why I'm telling you, those three points are like super key. They make things a lot easier. Okay, a bunch of drama. Let's go. Okay, now we finally get to the new stuff, okay? So we're going to go from here. So we know about that E number, right? And if you have this, this is called the natural exponential. Because this is a natural number. Okay. So if you have that, it's called the natural exponential. And so in science, that, that guy's going to pop up, right? Because isn't science all about our nature, right? Um, so it pops up a lot when we're talking about decay and growth. It comes up a lot, okay? Um, when we use, when we swap that over though, and we write it in its log form, this is called the natural logarithmic function, okay? So they just took this and they swapped the form over, they changed the variables a little bit just so that it looks like function notation. And this is what that ln button is in your calculator. So we know that the log button like that is log is 10. This one's called the common, right? Common log. 
But if you have log, or I'm sorry, ln by itself, that's log base e, and that one's called the natural log. Okay, so now you know what each of those buttons represent in your calculator. So if you are trying to do something with log base 10, you can use your calculator. If you're trying to do something with log base E, you can use your calculator. If it's any other base, you cannot use your calculator yet. Hopefully by the end of today, you can, okay? But not yet. So as I do these problems, I'm gonna probably be doing them the wrong way, okay? But when we get to the next section after the cool little trick, um, then we'll have freedom to use it whenever we want, okay? And so we'll see a lot of the same kind of problems all over again, but we have a tricks to do them, okay? So um, dun, dun, dun. this is telling you that this is the equivalent. If I don't ever memorize this, I am very much of the kind of person that the less I have to memorize, the better. I do not ever remember this ever. All I do is if I master this into exponential form, it's got an L, so I know it's a log, right? And it's a natural log, which tells me that it's actually log base E. And then all I do is use my rule that I used before in the past. And I say, okay, well, my base is E. I'm not gonna have X next to it anymore. I'm gonna have Y next to it now. And that means the X gets kicked across, right? And so notice I have the exact same equation they do, it's just in the opposite order, right? So I don't memorize that. That rule will not be given to you on the test. It's unnecessary, okay? As long as you have this information on your paper and you have the definition on your paper, you should be able to convert that if you had to. I don't even know that you have to. Okay, and just like the other one, you can graph it. All you have to do is remember that your base is E, okay? And so you'll have to estimate when you're graphing them because I know for this function, I'm gonna have the point negative one and it's reciprocal, zero and one, and then one and the base itself, which is E. And notice that's the exact same points that they have there, right? But how do you graph that? You'd have to know like what these numbers are, right? So I already talked about how to type in this. That's e to the negative one exponent, okay? So if you type e to the negative one in there, you get 0 0.4, about, right, 0 0.4. So you're gonna go negative one and almost at 0.5, right? And that's where that point is visually. Zero and one's easy. You just go zero and one, right? That one's not complicated to graph. But if I had to graph this, I know that's 2.718. So it's about three. I'll just put 2.7. 2.718, so the one does not change it. Right, that guy's not gonna change a seven. So it's just about 2.7. So you're gonna go over one unit and then up about 2.7, which is about where that's at, right? And so that's how you graph them if you have to graph some E stuff. Um, now here's one, let's try, start trying to use our calculator. So if you have your calculator with you, try it, okay? You want to be able to use these correctly so that you know you're doing it right when you're doing your homework, right? So if I want to find f of 2, I'm literally just plugging in 2 for x. And so in my calculator, if you have this one, you're just typing that LN button, putting a two. And if I had more stuff to type, I have to close, okay? If this is all you're typing in your calculator, you don't have to, it knows that that's it, okay? I could press enter. But if you had more to type, please make sure you close it, okay? And I get this number make sure that you're getting that same exact number. I'm gonna round to four decimal places. Normally in the web assignment, it'll ask you to round to four. Now, if I wanna plug in 0 0.3, now I'm plugging 0 0.3 for X. So the LN button and then 0 0.3. And I get negative 1.20. Oh, this one's gonna have a cascade. 
this seven is going to turn this to a 10, right? So seven is going to turn that to a 10, which means the one's going to carry over. So it actually becomes this. That one has a cascade effect. So be careful. The seven made the nine go up, but then that actually made the three go up, didn't it? Okay. And let's do the next one. Pay attention, there's a negative here, so I'm actually gonna put it in parentheses, just so that I don't think that, that's proper, improper notation, by the way. If you do this, it's like ln minus one, doesn't it? That's bad. One is, is that, X, well, you guys are not trig yet. You have to take the ln or the log of some, ln by itself means nothing. Watch what happens if I type the ln button by itself. It tells me what the heck do you want me to do with that, right? Or if I type in log by itself, oops, clear. It doesn't know what you want it to do. It needs something to compute, okay? So always make sure you tell me what you're computing here and then the rest of the expression. And in this inspection, expression, I am computing the negative one. So I put it in parentheses so that it looks like I'm taking the ln of this, right? Now let's see what happens when we do that though. I get domain error, okay? Why is that? That's because when they defined this, they told me that A had to be a positive number and X had to be a positive number, okay? So when they defined it, they already told me that I could only plug in positive numbers, which is why this doesn't exist. Oh gosh, this weird number, it's okay. It is a positive number, so it will compute it. I would not dare try to do that by hand. Um, let's see, ln of positive one plus the square root of two. And then be careful. In this calculator, you have to get out of the house before you can close that parentheses. If you get out, you're gonna have the parentheses on the inside of the radical, and it's gonna get confused. Okay, so make sure you get out of the house first and then close it. And I get 0 0.8814. We're getting to use a little bit more of our calculator. This is cool. Now they're just literally telling you how to type it in and then getting all the numbers. Okay, you don't write error in WebAssign, right? You write DME, so that's why I wrote DME, okay? Now here's some more logarithm, more properties. They're the exact same properties on the other side. It's just now instead of having an A, they have a specific base, which is E. But it's the same thing. It doesn't matter whether it was A or E, okay? It's the same three rules. I will not have this extra set of rules because it's for no reason. The other one was already so general, right? Okay, here we go. Human memory. I always like the word problems in these things, especially one where you like try to have, you have to age how old the mummy is. That one's really cool. Um, I don't know what this one is. It says students participating in a psychology experiment attended several lectures on a subject and took an exam. Every month for a year after the exam, the students took retests to see how, I think that should be plural, but anyway to see how much of the material they remembered. Oh, okay, gotcha. The average scores for the group are given by the human memory model. So I guess after mapping all of this, they tried to find a graph. My glasses keep fogging. They had to find a graph that had like the same image as all the points that they plotted for all the data that they got, okay? And so it turns out that the graph that had all the same data points as them looks like this function here, this really weird function, okay? You won't know how to do this, how to find that model until you get to another class, okay? So don't worry about it. We're not gonna actually find these models in this class. That's for another one. We will, however, do it for exponential functions when we get to that part later, the growth and decay stuff, okay? But for logs, we don't. Um, so they give me this thing here and they tell us that the time in the months, because they did it for one year, so it, it goes from zero to 12, right? So zero would be when they 
first took the initial test, right? And then all the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelves are going to be the months that they took the retests, right? Okay, what do they want me to do? It says, what was the average score for the original exam? That would have been the very first test you took, right? So they're giving you a hint there that that would be when the time was zero. So you're basically just plugging in zero for T. And I'm just gonna stick that whole thing in my calculator. I'm not even gonna worry about adding zero and one together. I don't need to, the calculator will do it for me. So 75 minus six, LN button, zero plus one, and then hit enter. And it turns out 75. So the average score was a 75. The very first time they learned the info and they took the test, that was the average test score. So some people might have remembered more, some people might have remembered less, right? But that's the average. Now what happens after, they took it every month. So this would have meant the second time they took a retest, right? But let's go figure out what that is. And again, I don't have to add that one. I can, it's not too hard to add one, right? Oh shoot, I need that number. I'm gonna cheat and I'm just gonna do zero to a two. And I get 68.4, okay? Web assign will tell you how they want you to round it, right? If they want just the whole number, they'll tell you, okay? But the average score was about a 68, the second retest that they took. So that's three times they've taken the same test, right? The initial one, a retest one month later, and a retest two months later, okay? Of course, it's gone down. <laughs> People do not remember stuff that long. Um, and then now six months. So I'm going to go back up here and plug in six. And on paper, let me just write down what I'm doing. And we get 63.3. So it's not going down too bad, right? It's going down, but not horribly. People are still remembering at least half of the stuff, right? So that's kind of how the human memory works. Now, this is just based on the data that these people collected, right? I mean, who knows if you collect like all the data throughout time, it's probably gonna be a different function slightly. So finally we get to, did you have a question? Anybody? Sure. So Ln is the neutral log. So it's a log, but with the base E. You can't put log with a base in your calculator yet. Okay. So the only, the only way we can put log base E in our calculator is by typing the Ln. But when I solve equations, I do change every time I see the word Ln, I usually change it to log and then with a little E, just because it helps me to know how to solve the equation. So you'll see me do that when we get back. So I don't use LN all the time, only if I have to use the calculator, okay? But good question. Okay, so here's some examples of stuff you might see in your web assign, right? So for 5.2, you might be asked to convert the forms over. So notice this one is in log form and they want us to put it in the exponential form. So remember the trick that I mentioned keep your base as the base of the exponential. And the other two numbers are basically gonna swap sides over that equal sign, right? So the two is not gonna be over there with the four as an exponent. And then the 16 gets kicked off, right? And is that true? Is four squared equal to 16? So you have a true statement, you know, you did it right, okay? Now the other way around is a little bit harder because you wouldn't really know if it was a true statement or not because logs are just really mind boggling, but I'm gonna switch it. So I know I need to convert to a log because this obviously has no logs, right? So we are gonna convert to a log. And then what should my base be? Right, the base of this exponential is three. And so then the other numbers, the negative four and the one over 81 have to swap sides. So I am not going to have a negative four over here with the three anymore. What is going to be here with the, with the three? The one over one. And then that leaves me no choice but to kick the negative four across, right? Normally I say across the line or across the fence. And when I say that, the equation 
is the equal sign is the line or the fence, okay? Now, this one asked me to do the one-to-one -one property. So we already know that that, I mean, you can write it. I usually do just because my brain does not compute LN. I don't know why. It just doesn't. I'm like, they're all logs. Why is this one different? <laughs> so my brain usually does not like LN, but I mean, it is convenient. Um, but I usually write a log base E just so that I know that. And you already know the rule, the one-to-one -one rule for regular logs. If these bases are the same, then that means that these arguments have to be the same in order for that thing, for you to tell me that this is equal to that, that means these things have to be the same too, right? So we're just gonna say a little implies that this argument has to equal the other argument. And then from there, it's a regular equation and however, whatever kind of equation it is, you follow those rules to solve it, right? I think when we saw it in the past, it was an, a linear equation, which is easy. You put the x's on one side, constants on the other side, and then you just divide by the coefficient, right? But this one's not a linear. If that were there by itself, that would be a linear, right? But because I got x squared, it's now a quadratic. So for quadratics, you have a totally different step, right? Things you gotta do. First thing you gotta do is get it equal to zero. So I minus 18 over. And then the next thing you gotta do is either factor it or use that quadratic formula, okay? And I think this one I can factor pretty easy. Um, X, no, maybe not. Oh, six plus three. Six and three, does that make sense? Multiply to give me negative 18 and combine to give me, nope, I have the wrong sign, don't I? So let me swap them. If I combine those, I'm gonna end up with a negative three. So, <laughs> let me change that to a minus, okay? So, then that means X is equal to what? Mm -hmm. X equals negative six and positive three. Now we have to remember though, this is what's interesting about logs. I've told you that there's two instances where you have to check your answers in the past. One of those instances is when you have a fraction because if any of your answers make the denominator of that fraction zero, that is not a actual answer, right? Then the second case of where you have, you have to check is if you have square roots, even roots, square root, fourth root, sixth root, any kind of even root in your equation, you have to check your answers because sometimes you could plug in numbers and the left side of the equation does not equal the right side, okay? So there's two kinds of equations you know you already have to check your answers for. Logs is another one. And the reason why is because that definition told us that not only can not only do the bases have to be positive, which for E is positive, right? It's positive 2.8, but the arguments also have to be positive. This is already positive, 18 is not gonna change, right? But I wanna make sure that that expression is positive for these two numbers, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to check to make sure. So I'm gonna say negative six squared plus three times negative six. And you can type it in your calculator if you want, but you should get 18, okay, positive 18. And so that one works. Didn't I get the same argument as I have over there, right? But I'm also gonna check the three. And this is nine plus nine, which is also 18. And so then they both check out. And so I can box both of them as my final answer. But I'm letting you know now, sometimes one of them will be bad and sometimes both of them will be bad, okay? And then you have no solution if they're both bad, right? So make sure you check them. Because if you just solve it and then put those answers in there and it's telling you no, no, it's probably because you didn't check one of them, okay? Oh, these were my colors. My printer prints in color, but the one here does not. <laughs> So that's why these are all in color, which I think is nice. If I had the money to buy all that ink, I probably would just print them all in color, but I don't. <laughs> so
So we're going to go to three, 5.3, but this is the notes that I had from the printer here on campus. So they're in black and white again, okay? Um, so 5.3 is now we're finally going to get into these properties of logarithms, okay? Um, I don't think I'm going to get... Oh, yeah. What the heck? This is awesome. In all the other books, they always give me these properties first. And I'm like, that's a whole lot. Like, why do you do that? And then they make you do everything by hand. And then they give you the change of base formula. And this is that trick that I told you where you can't type, type everything in your calculator right now. But as soon as you learn this rule, you'll be able to type everything in your calculator. Okay. And this book is awesome. It gives it to you first before they torture you. Okay. <laughs> so that's fantastic. Great. We need that rule. So here's the change of base rule. So we already know that all the calculators and almost all of them, I think it's a special kind of calculator you have to buy that does log with a base and then argument, okay? There is one out there, I don't know what it is, but there is one out there that does that. But most of our calculators only have those two options, the common base, which is base 10, and then the natural base, which is the E, okay? Those are the only two ones we have in our calc. So in order for us to take something that looks like this and use the calculator, you have these rules. Now, this is called the change of base formula. So you can literally change the base to whatever you want. It does not have to be the common base 10, and it does not have to be the natural base E. It could be anything which is why they give you this rule as a general rule, okay? So they tell you, you could change the base A to any base you want. All you have to remember to do is to use the old argument in the numerator and then use the old base as another argument in the denominator, okay? So notice the placement of everybody. You change your base to whatever you want and the old argument becomes the argument of the numerator and the old base becomes the argument of the denominator, okay? Now, because I can select any new base I want, of course, conveniently, I wanna choose the ones that I could put in my calculator, right? So if you wanna convert it to log base 10, then you would just use the log button of the old argument over the log button of the old base, okay? And then if you wanted to use the base E button, you can do ln of the old argument over ln of the old base, okay? I like to use this one for two reasons. One is that that's the first one that pops up when I type the button, right? So that's one thing, I less button pushing, I guess. One, I have to type it again to put log, right? So one reason is just because I'm lazy and I'd rather push a button once than twice, literally. <laughs> the second reason why I want to do that is because it's obvious you've changed the base if you're no longer using log and you're now using the letters LN. Isn't it very obvious you changed it, right? So I typically like to use this one. However, it does not matter. And I will show you that they're exactly the same answer, okay? So let's say, for instance, I want to change, I want to do this in my calculator. I already know the answer is one half did it earlier, okay? But I'm gonna try to first convert it using the log button, and then I'm gonna convert it using the LN button, okay? And so which of these two numbers is supposed to go in the numerator? The four, the argument goes in the numerator and the old base has to go in the bottom. Think base bottom, right? Now, it doesn't matter whether I type log of four over log of two. Oh, I typed, did I type it wrong? That's a good thing I did that though, because what happens if you do a half and half? You're gonna get the wrong answer, right? You have to do log and log or ln and ln. So it's actually a good thing I did that, just to point that out, okay? But let's do it correctly. <laughs> So log twice. See, that's why I don't like that log button. That's why I always use the LN because I will forget to hit it two times to make the LOG pop up. So now does that look in there like it's right? 
and I get two. Yeah, two to the two exponent is four, yes. Now let's see what we get when we get ln. So I'm gonna do the fraction again, but this time I'm gonna hit ln of four, close it up, ln of two and close it up. And I get the same exact number, right? So it does not matter which one you use, just make sure you use the same and the same at the bottom. I prefer this one just because it's obvious I've changed it, okay? If it no longer has L-O-G, then I obviously changed it, right? So you'll see me use that one more than anything. Uh, let's see. It says one way to look at a change of base formula is that logarithms with base A are constant multiples of logarithms with base B. The constant multiplier, what are they talking about? I don't know what they're talking about. For some reason, I feel like there's a page missing. I guess not. So the example was to compute this. I did it, but with a four and a two, right? Now they're telling you to do it with a 25 and a four, okay? So just make sure you do log of the 25 over log of the four or ln of the 25 over ln of the four. You do not have to show me the individual steps. You just need to put it in your calculator and give me the answer at the end, okay? You do need to show this though. Don't tell me that equals that without telling me how in the world you put that in your calculator, okay? So make sure that if you're computing this, that you show me what you're putting in your calculator, whether it's this or this, and then tell me what it is, okay? Always make sure you show that, that step. Um, so yeah, remember I told you that logs are exponents? And I told you that all the exponent rules are now gonna be applied as log rules. So you remember when you had like x squared times x cubed, right? x squared times x cubed. What did you do to those exponents to get the answer? Added them together and you got five, right? So that's the same thing here. So in order for you to do those together, you would get five. So what happens if I take um, the log of an exponent that's gonna get multiplied? What do you do with those exponents? You add the individual exponents, right? And remember, logs are exponents, okay? So that's where this rule came from. If I'm gonna multiply two things, I have to add the exponents. And it's very similar for the division, for the power to a power. What happens if you have a power to a power? You have this. In that case, what do you do with the exponents? Anybody remember? You multiply them in this case. Why? Because x squared cubes means I got three of them, don't I? And I'd have to add, add, and add, and you get six, right? Or you don't get six, but you get x to the six, okay? Repeated addition is the exact same thing as multiplication. That's what multiplication is, right? If I have to add 10 20s together, I'm just gonna do 10 times 20, and I'll know the answer, okay? So that's where all these rules come. I do not usually write this set just because I know that these are general logs for any base. So why would I have it over here separate for set a special base, right? It doesn't make any sense to me. All the rules, these rules apply for log of any base. So I could write the same rule without the bases and that would be the common property, right? I could write all these rules with base E and then it looks like LNs, okay? But it's the same rules for all three. These rules will be given to you on the test, okay? You're not gonna memorize them, although eventually after using them a while, you eventually just memorize them, okay? But these are gonna be very, very important. So they just start throwing things at you and saying, here, figure it out. <laughs> giving you all the info, figure it out, okay? So here's, for example, two, part A and part B. So they want us to write each logarithmic expression in terms of ln of two and ln of three. So the first one they give me is ln of six. So you have to be able to write this number in with twos and threes. How are you gonna write six with twos and threes? For in this instance, two times three is six, right? So that's how I wrote it. Then you're gonna apply that log rule. This is the rule. 
Oh, I think they use U and Bs. Depending on what book you use, they use Xs and Ys. It looks like this one's using Us and Bs. Okay. So if I have a product inside my argument, then basically I'm going to add the two separate logs, okay? So instead of doing this, I'm gonna do log of two plus log of three. And now I've written it in terms of log of L, twos and threes. Isn't this an expression with ln of two and ln of three, right? Now this one's a little bit more complicated. So um, the first thing they did was they used this rule So when you divide exponents or expressions that have exponents, you end up having to subtract their exponents, right? And it's always the top minus the bottom, right? So if I'm gonna take a division and split it up, it's always gonna be the log of the top minus the log of the bottom. And so that's exactly what they did here. Now we got lucky because we do have an expression of ln of two, but this is not an expression with twos or threes, okay? But is there a way to write 27 with some threes in it, okay? It is, we can write three with the exponent three, okay? And then they're applying the power property, which is the third one over there. And that one says, if you have log base B of something with the power, you end up multiplying those two. My computer screen with. Come on, figure yourself out. There we go. That's why I tell my kids all the time. You better figure yourself out <laughs> before you get in more trouble. <laughs> okay. So then now look at what they did with this little guy right here. This exponent went into the front, right? And so now there's no longer an exponent there. It's literally all that's happening. Is they're taking that exponent and putting it in the front, okay? they do get, they take some getting used to. I'm going to do them real fast, right? Because I've already done this like a million times, but it does take you a little while to get conditioned to it, okay? So make sure you do those homework assignments so you can practice that process. I always tell people math is not a spectator sport, just like watching basketball on TV. You can't just watch these NBA players and then be like, yeah, I can play like an NBA player. It does not work like that, right? You've got to practice a whole lot in order to get that good. It's the same with math. You have to practice, okay? It might look easy, but it ain't, right? <laughs> so be sure to practice. Okay, properties are useful for rewriting logarithms. We know this. Um, that is not telling me anything I don't know. Okay, let's go see. Now they're gonna make us do it with variables. Nothing's different. It's the same process of applying those properties, but there's letters in there now, okay? So if we've got this, and I'm gonna do it the long way first, just to show you, okay? Then I'm gonna show you the shortcut on how to do these. Cause I can look at this and know the answer. That's how the shortcut can work real fast. I can just look at, I already know what that's gonna look like as the answer, okay? But I want to show you, okay? So like, I'll just to prove your, prove it to you. I know that the answer is this. Just by looking at that, I know it, okay? I mean, I might as well just explain to you the shortcut because it's so much easier than having to do everything step by step, okay? The way it works is I know that everything's multiplied in there, right? Aren't I taking the log of all of this junk? right? And everything's multiplied. And I know that when I apply that property, all of the, are all the factors that are being multiplied are eventually going to have to have their own individual logs. And they're all going to have to eventually have each factor, right? Being added together. So I know from here, I'm going to have to do log base four of five plus log base four of X cubed plus log base four of Y just by applying the property log. And oh, they did it right here for me. I don't know why I'm doing it again. And I could have just looked right there, there's the answer. <laughs> I didn't even do that, that's silly. 
okay? But then you have the power property that says if you have these little power guys, they have to go as coefficients. And so notice that that's where the three came from, right? Now you can look at it and already know, I'm gonna have to add all those separate logs, but that middle guy is gonna have a three in front, okay? And so that's how you can shortcut those, okay? Now this one's different. I am gonna talk about that one because that one is not the same. You notice that three X and then you have a minus in the middle. There was no rule that said that you could take an addition or a subtraction and then rewrite it some way. There was no rule like that. All you had was multiplying inside the argument and dividing inside the argument. And then if your argument had an exponent, right? Those are the only three properties. So big, 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 you'll get that major, mis major conceptual error thing on, and then only get one point, right? On the test, if you try to split up a log that has a plus or a minus, do not split up a log that has a plus or a minus, okay? It's a no-no, there's no rule that lets you do that. So what I can do is I can split up this quotient into the log of this minus the log of that. Because I know for division, you have to subtract, right? For multiplication, you add. Then I know that I can write this radical thing as an exponent. I can write all of that junk on the inside to the one half exponent. And what do we do with those one half exponents? Any exponent, you kick it out into the front, right? So this little exponent will go in front of that log. So it'll be one half ln of three x minus five. And I promise you, everyone's gonna wanna split this up and you can't because of that minus, okay? Just leave it alone. Of course, I'm probably gonna have a whole page just for that, but <laughs> I'll skip over there in a second. Now the shortcut is, because they're gonna, they're, I don't know if they're gonna give it to you, but I'm gonna make one up right now in a second, because I want you to be able to apply the shortcut no matter how big it looks, okay? Yeah, seeing it's like a whole page over here to do this stupid problem. I'm gonna give you a part C, and I'm gonna tell you log base seven of, x squared y to the negative no not the negative um square root of y and then i'm gonna have z to the three you can shortcut this you know what i'm gonna have another letter down here w before This is the way you shortcut. You know that if they're multiplied, it's supposed to be a plus, right? And you know that if it's a division, it's supposed to be a minus, okay? Here I have two things at the bottom, so they're gonna have two minuses. And you have two things at the top, so you're gonna have two additions. And all of those guys' exponents have to go in the front. So watch how I tear this apart. You have to have log base seven for all four variables, okay? So for the first variable, I'm gonna have log four and the X, but that exponent has to go to the front, okay? And it's positive because it's coming from the top, okay? The next one, I'm gonna have plus because it's also at the top. And I'm gonna have log base seven, I have to. The next variable is Y. What is the exponent on that Y? Not one not two, what are square roots? What is it? A half, that's a half exponent, okay? You have to remember that square roots are half exponents, okay? Remember, they're half exponents. If you had a cube root, what kind of exponent would that be? One third, 
what if I happen to have the fourth root of x cubed? What is that as an exponent? Three fourths. Okay, so you have to remember this, okay, in order for you to do a shortcut, okay? Then now I'm going to go toward the bottom variables. This one's at the bottom, so I have to put a minus, okay? And then I'm going to do log with seven and my variable. But what is the exponent that should go in front? And then finally, the last one, but it's also at the bottom, right? So I'm going to use a minus again, log base seven, my w, and then what exponent goes in the front? Four. And then that's the whole thing. And I swear you're going to use like five or six lines if you tried to do that one step at a time. Okay. Because your first step would be to break up the quotient. Then the second step would be to bring up this product and then this product. Then the third step would be to distribute the minus. I know you don't know what I'm saying because we didn't do it the long way. And then the last step or step would be to bring all the little powers down. So I'll do it just so you can see how it looks. So I should have done the top. You don't have to write this. I'm just proving a point, okay? You would have had to do the top minus the bottom, right? Using the log rule, the quotient rule, okay? Then you would have had to use the product rule twice here and here. So you would have had log of x squared plus log seven of y squared y. Then you would have had minus whatever you get when you split up this. So log seven of z cubed plus log seven of w to the fourth. But that minus applies to all of that, right? So if I distribute it, bear with me, I gotta copy all this crazy stuff down. If I distribute it, then both of them have a minus, which is why I told you, if it's at the bottom, it's gonna have a minus, okay? And then the last step is have to put all the little powers in the front. So this guy is going to have to go in front there. This one half will have to go in the front there. That guy will have to go in the front and that guy would have to go in the front. That's a lot of steps, right? A lot of writing. So if you do learn the shortcut, it helps a whole lot to do it faster. Okay. Now, what do they want for applications? Still have some time, so we should be able to finish this section, which was my goal, is just to finish this one section. Okay, so it says one method of determining how x and y values for a set of non-linear data, which means when I plot them, you can see like curvature on the graph, okay, um, is to take the natural logarithm of each x and y values. If the points when graphed fall on a line, then you can determine that the x and y values are related by the equation of this, okay? Where m is the slope of that line. So I guess they are gonna introduce you a little bit, tiny, tiny bit, into how to come up with these equations. Now you won't have any of these in your homework, I don't think, but I'm gonna go double check. So it says, here's your data, right? It says it shows the mean distance from the sun as x, and the period y, which is the time it takes the planet to orbit around the sun. For each of the six planets that are closest to the sun. So in this table, you have everything. So you have all the planets, you have their distance from the sun, and then the period that it took them to make one orbit around the sun, okay? And I believe y is in years, if I'm not mistaken, does it tell me at all? It does not tell me. Oh, yes, it does right here. My finger is at, hello. T is in years, okay? So X is in distance and then T is in years. Now, what they've done is they've actually taken the information and they plotted it on a graph. And you notice that this is not exactly a line. If I try to draw a line there, these points are not on that line, right? If I try to draw a line here, those two points are not on the line, okay? So it doesn't really fall a linear pattern. So what they did was they took the ln of all the x values, they took the ln of all the y values, and then they plotted that. And when they plotted those points, notice that they're all on the same line, right? And so that's what tells them 
oh, well, I can use a log function to describe that curve, okay? And so then they also notice that if you take any two of these points, okay, if you take two of these points, and of course, conveniently, you want to use that one, right? It's got zeros in it, doesn't it? <laughs> so you definitely want to use that as one of your points. And then I think they took the next point right here. They took those two points. And so they found the slope between those two points. So the y value minus the y value, the x value minus the x value. And they got about this decimal number, which means the slope was about 3 halves, OK? Um, then, now that you know what that slope is, you can write the equation as ln of y equal to that slope times ln of x, according to that definition, OK? Don't think we have to do that. They're just kind of introducing it to you, like how someone would know that the function looks like a logarithm, OK? And that's how. To be honest, I didn't even know that. <laughs> so that's how often you're going to use it, right? OK, here's the good stuff. What are we going to see on our homework, right? This is the stuff you'll see in your homework. Of course, there'll be more problems, not just one of each, right? There will be multiples. They might word it in a different way just to see if you can catch it, right? Um, but this is essentially the stuff. So it says, evaluate this, this logarithm by using your change of base formula and then sticking it in your calculator and rounding your answer, okay? It wants me to round it to three decimal places. So remember, when I convert it, I like to use LN, so it's obvious I converted it, okay? So I'm gonna do LN and LN, which number goes in the top and which one goes at the bottom. Remember, base, bottom, right? Base goes in the bottom. So that three will go at the bottom and the 13 will go at the top. Now I can type that in my calculator. I'm gonna go fraction LN of 13 over LN of three. And if I round that to three decimals, I get 2.335. Okay, now this one was like that other problem. This one's really just to make sure you know how to use the properties. You cannot use the calculator on this problem. And I, from what I remember, I think there's a problem like this on the final. And I think there's a problem like this on the test. Okay, so this one's a big one. And I will have people type this in their calculator because not a lot of times they give you the number here, they don't give you B. So I'm glad they put B here because then you can't type it in your calculator, right? But a lot of times they'll use a number there and then people will just type LN of 18 over LN of that number in their calculator and tell me the answer. But that's not following the directions, is it? The directions is saying for you to use this fax, okay? So you have to use those facts to find the answer, okay? So be very careful because if the computer gives you a number and you get used to using that calculator, when you see it on the review, you're gonna be like, what the heck is this, okay? I want you to practice this process. So I've got log base B of two, of three, and of five. Now they have bad notation. I'm guessing their computer did not allow them to do a super a subscript. So notice how it says log B, and the B is like the same font as the log, right? And it's in the same line. Do not write that on your paper. That is bad notation. You'll get points off. It has to be like this, okay? It has to be with the B as a little tiny subscript, okay? But the three numbers I need to focus on are two, three, and five. Can I use two, three, and five to make 18 somehow? Only with multiplication, division, and exponents, okay? I know for a fact that um, two times nine is equal to 18, right? So I've used them too, fantastic. But let's go even further. How can I write the nine using threes or fives? Is it nine a three squared, right? And then I can use my shortcut and split this all up. So I can say log base B of two, and there's no exponent there. So I don't need to actually write an exponent there. Okay, it's a one, but it's invisible, right? 
aren't one coefficients also invisible, right? So we don't have to write that, but I have a times, so it's gonna be a plus, and then log base B of three, but that exponent has to go to the front. And so it becomes a two right there, okay? The same rules that we did with the variables, right? It's just numbers, same exact rules. So the plus is there because of the multiplication. If this were division, I'd have to use a minus. And then all your exponents do need to go in the front of those individual logs. And then I'm going to use the info that they gave me. So they're telling me that log base two is actually this number. And log base B is this number. I just have to multiply it by the two because I had a coefficient over here, didn't I? Right, don't I have two times that log B three? So I have to do times two of that number. Now I'm just gonna type this in here, 0 0.3562 plus two, 0.5646. And I get 1.4854. And a lot of times if you just, I'm thinking people are going to do this problem not following the directions. It just happens. I hope it doesn't, or it happens at least a lot less than it would if I didn't mention anything. Um, if that were not a B and that were a number, right? Any number, if you took type in your calculator directly and you didn't eat these numbers, chances are your decimal is going to be off a little bit because they rounded all these numbers, didn't they? And if you put it in your calculator, it's gonna give you the exact answer and it's gonna be off, okay? And so you're gonna be like, but I typed it in my calculator and I got this, this should be right. Well, that's not what they told you to do, first of all. And second of all, there's a reason why it's wrong, okay? Because all these other numbers are rounded. Okay, now last one in this section, I think it's the last one. Yeah, I think it's the last one in this section. So the last one in this section is to expand all of this stuff. So we're going to have to expand it all. And that one should be pretty easy. How many, how many terms am I gonna have when I set this up? How many things are being multiplied together? How many factors? That's the word actually, right? How many factors are being multiplied together there? It's not two. Three. It's three, because you've got a number times the Bs times the Cs, right? So there's three factors there. Only one of them has an exponent, right? And because they're all multiplied, when I split them up into the individual logs, they're gonna all be added, subtracted, or a combo. When I split them all up, are they all gonna be plus, 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 or minus, plus, what are they gonna be? Pluses. All pluses, because they're all multiplied. The only time you do the minus is if you have a bottom, right? A denominator. That's the only time you do the minus, okay? So I know I'm gonna have log base four of something plus log base four of something plus log base four of something else. Three factors means three terms, okay? So the 13 goes first. It does not have an exponent, so I do not need a coefficient over here. Next is the B, but this does have an exponent, doesn't it? Which means I will have a coefficient over here in the front. And then C is last, and C does not have an exponent, so there's no coefficient in the front right there. Okay. But that is using the um, that shortcut that I showed you, okay? You're always gonna see this when there's variables in here. It says, assume all variables are positive. That is literally for the people who like, I call them smart Alex, but really they're just smart, right? <laughs> Cause if they remembered, you can't take the log of a negative, right? And you're like, but you have a variable in there, a variable sense it could be any. And so then they say, well, no, it's not, it can't be anything. Just assume that it's only a positive. That way you can actually do the problem. Otherwise, this makes no sense if B and C are negative. Okay. okay, that's the end. Let me go double check to make sure before I let you guys go that there's nothing of those weird log ones in there. 
that one where they had the table and then they took the logs of everything and then they um, came up with the slope and did all that weird stuff. I don't remember ever doing that. So I just wanna make sure it's not in here. I know I like literally only have like six or seven minutes, but let's see, change of base. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, that's all change of base properties. Nothing new, nothing new. Oh, look, it's the exact same problem. Um, one, I haven't done that one. Let me write that one down. What is that, 23? Okay, that one you can do, it's just gonna have a plus and then a minus minus, right? One's gonna be positive and then two of them are gonna have a negative log. This one be careful because that means Y is one ninth, Z is one ninth and X is what? Two ninths, right? So make sure that when you have that radical, if it's over everybody, the Y is gonna be one ninth exponent, the Z is gonna be one ninth exponent, but the X will be two ninths exponent, okay? Um, these, we haven't done any of those. I actually want to do the big one. Let me do the big one. 28, yes. We haven't done any of the compression. We've done all the expanding, taking one log and expanding it into a bunch of logs. What we haven't done is the compression. And that's when you have a bunch of logs and you need to write it as one, okay? So real quick, we're gonna do these two. Now, this one I wanted to talk about because we know that that can factor, right? So that can be written as a product. We know that it can be x plus one and x minus one. And so then when you split it up, you actually have three things. You have two factors from the top and then you have one thing at the bottom, don't you? So when you split it up, it's gonna be ln of the first guy plus, because he's at the top, ln of the second guy. And then the bottom one's going to have a minus ln of the third guy. But instead of writing x to the ninth, where should I put that exponent? In the front. Okay. So make sure if you do have x squared minus something that you factor it. And then you can use the rule for the two factors. Okay. We haven't done a compression one. My biggest thing is that it literally is just like the shortcut for the addition, except you're going backwards. So we know that when we're splitting it up, all the positive logs go on the top or come from the top, right? And all the negative logs come from the bottom. Well, if they give it to you all expanded out, you should know that all the positives are going to end up at the top and all of these negative guys are going to be at the bottom, okay? So when I do this, I'm gonna write this as LN and I'm just gonna have one big thing, okay? I'm gonna combine all three terms into one LN. Now, at the top of this thing is gonna be this positive term. What is it gonna be in the top? Can you tell me? X squared, good, because this guy is gonna come up as an exponent and it's gonna be X squared. It's going backwards now, right? Now the two at the bottom, there's no exponents, right? because there's no numbers in front. And the minus just tells me they go down here. So that means I'm gonna have x plus four down here and x minus four down there. And then whenever we have a number in front of a log, that number is just an exponent, isn't it? So really you have x squared, x plus four, x minus four with a giant cube on it, okay? And if you want to simplify it, you could. All you can do is just cube each person individually. So you would have x to the six, x plus four to the cube, and x minus four to the cube. I'll zoom in because it's kind of tiny. Okay. But I gave that guy the cube power, which turned it to a six. I gave that guy the cube power, and I gave that guy the cube power, right? Using our power rules. 
And so that is what you will type in your computer. Your computer might actually take this one also. I had not done one like that. So if you only had that, because I think that's the problem before this one, if you only had this, you would know it would be x squared over x plus four, right? X squared over x plus four. Okay. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? I'm literally like out of time. <laughs> it's a lot. Please, please, please practice. Right now, you should have enough info to start practicing. If you haven't started 5.1, work on 5.1. We did kind of sum up and finish 5.2, and then we finally got into 5.3. So you have enough for those first three homework assignments. So start working on those for sure, okay? 5.4 and 5.5 are just using the information. So you're going to see it more and more and more, the same information, okay? But that's it. You guys have a great day. If you get stuck on problems, always text me.